as you know, uh, this topic is, as I said, on the humanitarian, philanthropic, and philosophical legacy of the title. So the, the aim of today's program, uh, and I think it's a very first time attempt uh, in the world, I would say, I'm challenging, to unravel the intellectual uh, contributions of Imam Ali, uh, and to emphasize the relevance of Ali's intellectual theories to contemporary Western academic circles. Uh, so, as most of you know, HECMA has been uh, a research-based group comprising of students, current students, graduates uh, from the University of Sydney, from the University of Western Sydney, from the University of UNSW, New South Wales, uh, which are focused on the Islamic world's intellectual heritage from socio-political theories through to philosophical discussions and dialogues. Uh, although many of the people here today, alhamdulillah, uh, are present uh, and are familiar with the personality of Ali as a central religious figure in the development of early Islam during the life of the Prophet Muhammad, through to the civil wars which ensued following the Prophet Muhammad's demise. There is sadly very little scholarship on the Imam's philanthropic, political, metaphysical, philosophical traditions. There's been very little study, for example, on Imam Ali in terms of political and economic justice, uh, in terms of his metaphysical theory of justice, uh, his theories of space-time, his theories of matter, consciousness, idealism, and all other relevant discussions in the current contemporary philosophy of mind uh, There is also this heavy emphasis of recognizing and emphasizing the warlike figure of the Imam to the extent of reducing him to a cold, brutal, but contrastingly humble, intelligent, and tender individual whose contributions far exceed mere contributions to the development of Islamic history. Okay, because uh, as I have been telling people as I've been progressively coming, uh, there was an emergency, one of our presenters will not be presenting today, his wife is not well, and I asked if you all to keep him in the family and in, in your prayers. Uh, but I had done this, <coughs> we have three presentations today. Uh, Mohammed is on his way, the traffic is terrible. But before uh, I get to this, I just want to emphasize that this was actually meant for uh, another of our research uh, uh, friends to have done this, and I did collaborate with him. So I can address any questions that you may have uh, at the end of the discussion. Okay, so let me continue. So the first discussion is portrayals of Imam Ali or Ali ibn Abi Talib throughout history. From the early schisms to the Safafid dynasty. Okay, so the first aspect of what uh, he wanted to cover today, Jaspir wanted to cover today, was the following research question. Why haven't the words and thoughts of Ali ibn Abi Talib been the subject of serious study in Western scholarship? I think that's a very interesting and fair question. Why has he been neglected all this time? So the content of today's, uh, for this segment's segment talk is Ali in the rift of political schisms. The second is Ali in the Omeyyad and also in the Abbasiyin literature. Then you also have the interest, the rising interest in, in, Western, in Western academic circles concerning Imam Ali through Henry Corbin. Um, and he gradually introduces Imam Ali but through the esoteric essence of, of his works. Um, and then fourthly, we will address the relevance of Ali to contemporary scholarship. Okay, so as you all know, please keep this in your mind. The research question is, why have we neglected him in Western scholarship in, in easy terms? Or why have the works and the thoughts of Ali ibn Abi Talib been the subject of serious study in Western scholarship? So the first point that needs to be raised is Ali became the center of political sectarianism and scholarship sought to address those issues. So that's the first issue that we need to make very clear. We emphasize too much on the political ramifications, the political schisms that we have altogether neglected the content of this magnificent man's work. 
we have totally avoided it, ignored it, uh, if not not taken into serious account. He said he's not relevant to Western literature, he's not relevant to academic circles because he's just a religious figure. No, you can integrate all of these two together. Religion is very relevant to academia. So this issue as uh, the issue of political sectarianism and scholarship. Uh, we will address this in slides concerning the Omeyyad and the Abbasids and how they had uh, played a massive role in, in changing or altering or having a massive influence on how we understood Imam Ali through, as a political, as a historical personality. So you also have Ali's intellectual force became neglected as I have covered in Western scholarship. You have Madelon, Wilfred Madelon, one of the earliest uh, Western Orientalists. You have Henry Lamens, one of the greatest French soci sociologists, who assessed Ali on the literature presented from the Omeyyad and the Abbasian sources. And that's the first central issue that we have. Uh, all of Western scholarship so far has focused on understanding who Ali is through the political schisms. And not just that, but they've also focused on who Imam Ali is through understanding him through the Omeyyads and the Abbasid sources. So that's a major problem that we have. Okay, there's also been Ali's Gnostical tradition, his Gnostical knowledge, he became revealed gradually in Henry Corbin's work. Henry Corbin was a great French philosopher. Uh, many of you may be familiar with him. He had great encounters with Anon uh, uh, uh And we'll get to that in the slide as well. So, Ali in the 21st century, our role, our duty within Hekima is to emphasize the intellectual legacy of this great individual in this context. Okay, so first, the first topic, uh, Ali and the rift of political schisms. So as you all know, most of you are familiar with, uh, Imam Ali, Ali ibn Abi Talib, fulfills a political, legislative, spiritual, and even cosmic role within various expressions of Sunni and also in Shiite Islam. Uh, unfortunately, due to the vast amount of the Omeyyad sources and Abbasid sources, Ali is also very less revered amongst the Khawarij. Uh, and just to bear in mind, the Khawarij was the early uh, political fragment of the Shiites that had turned against the Imam after the treaty with Muawiyah. Uh, so given that he plays such a multitude of roles, it's only common sense and natural that Ali's biography becomes a subject to varying and different interpretations. Uh, most extant historical sources are influenced by the sectarian concerns. You're going to have to excuse me because uh, I was not preparing to do this, uh, this part of the presentation, that's why I'm reading all of it. Uh, but I do have my own presentation, which I can hopefully talk about one. Okay, so uh, to continue the tradition of Ali and the rift of political schisms during the time of the Omeyyads, what we find is the political victory of Muawiyah led to political control of Hadith literature and early interpretations. So when we had uh, the rise of the Omeyyad dynasty, we consequently had the rise of the influence of mass media. So you can consider the Omeyyads who had a massive influence on how people generally pursued and understood religion, how they understood life, how they understood politics, economics, everything. So here you have Muawiyah as a central figure in distorting a lot of the Islamic, early Islamic traditions in understanding even who Imam Ali really was. For example, consider Shahab al-Din al He's a great, fantastic uh, scholar in the Sunni world. Uh, a lot of narrations in Sahih al-Bukhari and Muslim come back to Shahab al-Din al He is the source of all, of the majority of the sources. They say, Shahab, this is being narrated by Shahab uh, al-Din al who has narrated this from Aisha, who has narrated this from a certain companion. So all, or, or most of the historical sources, a hadith literature, come back to Shahab al-Din al And what we find when we understand the biography of this individual who narrates hadith is that he was very much influenced by the Omeyyads. He was actually working for the Omeyyads. So here you have the start of influences, the start of political abuse. Uh, in understanding a great historical Okay, so here you have the early hadith literature expresses biases from both camps of Muawiyah and Ali. However, Ali became a greater victim due to the influence of the Omeyyads. 
So that's not to dismiss the fact that the, we also have Shiite traditions that are very biased towards uh, the Omeyyads, very, uh, very excessively in favor of, of, uh, of Imam Ali, to an overall exacerbating the extent that it's not even considered mainstream Shiites. So we have to also bear in mind, the, uh, not to be biased, that there is also a, there is, there is a mixture of sources from both ends which express great political biases. So the political orthodoxy of the ruling of my position declared that only the caliphate of the first three caliphs were legitimate and not that of Ali. So here you have uh, the traditional cursing of Ali and the Umayyad during the time of the Umayyads. These are historically documented sources and the references there in Sahih Muslim and from Bukhari. Uh, you find this constant tradition of cursing Ali and those that did not curse Ali would be executed or put in political asylum. So you had this tradition from the, from the early on in the Umayyads that only the three caliphs were legitimate but not Ali. So that's how traditions work. Okay, so let's give an example of the Umayyad propaganda. Uh, Ali upset Fatima by demanding hand of Abu, the daughter of Abu Jahan, thereby upsetting the Prophet. So to many of us here, th this doesn't make sense, to know a particular figure in such a way, growing, growing up knowing him all your life in a certain way, to see this does not make sense. And that's correct. This is a great example of political bias. A great example of political bias. But from the time of Ma'awi and the um, and then they even say that Imam Ali was not waking up for prayers and the Prophet was reciting the verse again uh, uh, in the Insan uh, Ahl Jadal. Man is probably, uh, certainly a quarrelsome bunch. They are a creation of people that just complain and nag. So here you have in, within these two hadith examples, examples of political biases against Ali from the very early period. Mind you that, that although Bukhari and Muslim and the great six canonical sources come in the Abbasid period, which comes after the Omeyyad period, but you find that their chain of narrators come back to the Omeyyads. Okay, so I hope that point is clear. Okay, so now let's go into the Abbasid period. So as probably most of you are familiar with following the Omeyyads came the Abbasids, um, and probably during the third century, um, after Hijra, or in the Western scholarship we call this the 9th century. Uh, it marks a formative period in Islamic historiography and religious and political positions from the development of the first authoritative hadith collections, biographical dictionaries and universal chronicles. Uh, as you all know, biographical dictionaries, they evolved into providing complex interpretive picture of people, events and historical processes. For example, the Fadara. So we have a section in, uh, in a lot of Sunni historiography that talks about the virtues of certain companions. And you can see by this time period that they began to express political biases, uh, about, particularly about political favoritism. For example, you don't really have any, from what we understood previously, that uh, the political orthodox at the time from the Omeyyad time is ensured that only the first three caliphs were legitimate and Ali was not legitimate. This was a political trend from the time of the Omeyyads down to the Abbasids. But now you see at the time of the Abbasids an a great individual figure in the Sunni world known as Ibn Hanbal. He began to start uh, understanding that Ali's caliphate needs to be deemed fully legitimate. Uh, so, the and this is where we begin to see the definitive usage of the four rightly caliphs. So here you see a progressive historical understanding uh, from the time of the Omeyyads down to the time of the Abbasids of how we have a gradual process uh, of Ali as understood as a personal personality in early Islamic history. So you, can, you here in the beginning have him completely removed. He was not a legitimate ruler. His rule was full of civil wars, controversy. And now you have, only during the time of the Abbasid, during the time of Ibn Hanbal, you have the rise of the idea that we need to consider him amongst the four rightly guided caliphs. And this is where the beginning of the term al Rashid came in. Okay. But regardless, put that all aside, they still had the debate whether we can consider Ali, was he fourth best or wasn't he, because you still have other figures as well, like other companions, are they considered to be better than him or not? 
So although you have this bias, but at the same time you have the beginning of introducing Ali as one of the greatest four companions to have ruled in the early Islamic uh, civilization. Okay, let's give examples uh, of the early political schism. Okay. Uh, and this originates back to sectarian interests. So here you have, as I was talking about, Ali was the first person to convert to Islam after the Prophet or not. Uh, you have Shi'i sources, you have Sunni sources that depict him as converting soon after Khadija, even though he would not have yet been an adult. Others identify Abu Bakr as the second uh, convert and Ali as the third. Uh, still, others place Muhammad's adopted son Zayd uh, before Abu Bakr but after Ali. So here you have a very a great contrast and a great conflict um, about whether he was the first or the second to have converted. So you see a great political schism here from a very early period. Okay, I hope that point is clear. Second example, Ali the Om. You can, there are many interpretations. Some will argue that Ali, uh, as a Shia tradition will argue that Ali, uh, the Prophet had granted Ali complete political uh, uh, and spiritual leadership. But then after, at the end, you will also have the other school of thought that will argue that no, um, Ali may have been elected as a spiritual leader, but that does not necessarily negate him to be a political leader. So you have all these schisms that begin from a very early period. And because you have all these schisms, you have a lot of mysteries behind who this Ali is. From a very early period, no one can definitively say who is Ali. Because you have all these schisms, and as you go down in time and in history from the Omeyyads and the Abbasids and the Seljuks and later down to the Ottomans and then even to the Safavids, you have this entire different uh, kaleidoscopic blend of understanding of who this historical personality was. So I hope that makes sense. Okay, now let's look into Ali and the rift of political schisms, but from the Shiite history. So how you could see that there is Shiite bias as well. So belief in Ali's leadership and rightful claim to the Caliphate is the defending doctrine of Shiite Islam. Okay, so perhaps most of you understand this word. Ali's sayings are a source of instruction for Shiite legal systems. So you have the various classes of Shiite Islam. You have the Imamiyin, you have the Ibn Ashari, you have the Zaydiyya, you have the Ismaili, you have all these different types of legal systems um, which became devised later by legal rulers um, who claimed that I have a hadith that was narrated by Ali ibn Abi Talib and that's how they derived the, uh, the legal understanding. Okay, general Shiite belief in Ali's superiority over the other companions and his designation by the Prophet. So now here you know that this is a particularly Shiite understanding. Then you begin to have devotional and moralistic guidance which gave rise to a tendency towards esotericism and mysticism in most forms of Shiite Islam. So as most of you are familiar, maybe not familiar, what Shiite Islam uh, is distinct, how it's distinct mainly from the Sunni understanding of Islam, is that Shiite Islam really connects with the esoteric dimensions. This is why, this is one aspect we can analyze how they were different. Uh, so here you have an integral, uh, central understanding, a very deep spiritual understanding that connects the Imamite concept with uh, Wilaya and all these other different concepts. So here you have an integral understanding. Uh, and it's a very esoteric understanding. Okay. Uh, and as you know, among the Imams, the Wilaya essentially refers to absolute obedience uh, to Ali, and that is considered an article. article. For example, uh, Ismailis, for example, considering of such a high rank that he's recognized as being a, uh, at a higher status than an Imam. So they took him at a level of a lot higher than what the Shiite traditions began to take. And then you have the extreme uh, ends of Shiite Islam, known as the Ulat. Uh, and they considered Ali as a sort of spiritual fulcrum who fights up demons and has special access to God's will. So you have all these different interpretations that arose from Sunni Islam, from the Omeyyads, the Basis, then you have uh, from the Safafids, and most of these traditions come post-Safafid period. 
you have all these other dimensions of Shiite Islam that emerge. And also in India, with the tradition of uh, Ismailis, they were prominent in India, a very small population, minority in India, the Ismaili Shiite Muslims, and you have the Zaydis and uh, mainly Yemen. Okay, so now let's go into the Western world. Uh, how Ali's intellectual thoughts became neglected in Western scholarship. So on the left you have uh, Henry Keitani and you have on the right Henry Lamanis. They were both great early Oriental scholars that wanted to learn more about Islam and they were probably among the first in Western scholarship to have written something on Islam. Uh, so what we call them is Mustashriqin or Orientalists. Mm. Uh, so they began to study Ali as a political figure. And because they understood Ali and they studied Ali as a political figure, the personality of Ali became imbued in civil war. So he was a figure that was involved in, in a political crisis. So that was, we, in one way, Ali, Ali's, uh, in Western scholarship, Ali's understanding became, oh, uh, personality of understanding of Ali became very limited to this dimension that he was involved in the political schism between Muslimism and Shiism and uh, he had claims to a right of caliphate. He had all these uh, aspects that, that came and uh, they were too imbrued in studying about whether Ali's claim was correct or wasn't correct, whether um, these sources are valid or invalid, whether those other sources which I showed you earlier about uh, from Bukhari and Muslim and certain other canonical sources of the Sunni school, whether they're valid or invalid, you get caught up in all this uh, historiographical understanding that we forgot the intellectual legacy. Uh, and also, by the way, the men's uh, has a harsh criticism in, Ali's, uh, in assessment of Ali's political career. So here you have the vast influence of the Romanians and the Abbasids. And Keitani as well gives uh, a weight, it uh, gives yeah, pressure to. Uh, he gives he gives Ali the benefit of the doubt and says that look uh, he was under pressure a lot of the time so we can't really judge his character in political situations because he was under a lot of pressure from all sorts of camps all fighting against him. Okay, so Henry Corbin. Henry Corbin was uh, one of the greatest scholars. He was a French scholar, and in the 1900s he wanted to introduce all the Shiite esoteric concepts. Uh, to Western, to the Western scholarship, but his area of specialty focused on Gnosticism and mysticism. Uh, so he began to understand Ali and uh, in Western scholarship under the uh, in the way that he Ali is a central figure in all Sufi tariqahs. So he is every Sufi tariqah, every philosophical, esoteric understanding of Ali and Islam come back to Ali from the Sufi. So, and he also went to Shiite esotericism, which is what I made the comment earlier about these things. That Shiite Islam, essentially from Sunni Islam, and makes Islam very close to Sufism. Shiite Islam, very close to Sufism, is the esoteric dimension. Okay, so this is a very famous uh, discussion between Corbin and Tawatawali. Uh, most of you maybe are, aren't familiar with Anun and Tawatawali. was a great Persian philosopher in the 1900s and the 20th century. Okay, and Corbin asks him an interesting question. There are claims that Najib Balaba cannot be authoritatively attributed to Ali ibn Abi Talib. How do you prove this is the work of Ali? And uh, Tawatawa gave an amazing answer. He says, whoever is the author of Najib Balaba, we consider him Ali. <laughs> so yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, well, it's, it's quite interesting. Because it's true. Um, we have lost Ali in a sort of way. And that cannot be denied. But also at the same time, whoever is the author of Najib al is a great idol. Whoever he is, if it be the real Imam Ali. I'm of the tendency that Najib al is authentic, because I can share tradition. But nonetheless, we also have to bear in mind that we also have personal biases, so I want to be as objective as possible. Okay, so now let's go to the final aspect of this talk. Mohammed uh, still hasn't come yet. Is he five minutes? So I'll try to prolong this. Okay. Uh, the relevance of Ali to contemporary scholarship. So there has been no study attempting to disseminate Ali's contribution uh, towards uh, 
So what few examples of a lost array, so I lost my chain of thought there, and I'm actually sort of having a time coming up. Mohamed, please uh, pass it down, if you're up next. Uh, so, okay, contemporary, contemporary scholarship. First of all, as we were talking earlier on, uh, Arabic grammar, very wonderful example. Uh, all everyone attributes Abu Aswad al Ali. Abu Aswad al Ali is the founder of, of Arabic grammar, the father of it. Uh, syntax, he comes from a Sibawai, uh, uh, who was a Persian. That, that's uh, interesting how Persians influence Arabic grammar. Uh, but Abu Aswad al Dua'i, he is the central figure of Arabic grammar. But little do we actually know, Abu Aswad al Dua'i was a student of Ali. It's like people emphasizing, oh, Mullah Sadra, Mullah Sadra, but who was his uh, teacher? Mirna. So here you have, there's a heavy emphasis on the students, but we've lost the teacher. So, so metaphysics as well, and this was covered by Alu Metawatawati, and he has a fantastic book, fantastic book, uh, called Ali and Metaphysics. And all, this has been translated into English, but it has not reached Western audiences as far. So one of our later aims, inshallah, in the future is to try and ensure that these great personalities like Imam Ali become known to us, known in Western scholarship, they're worthy of it. Rather than keeping them within our cultural understanding, we have to understand who they really were. I think we don't even understand who they really were. Okay, you can also relate Ali to political theories of tolerance, non-violence, as I mentioned earlier, the metaphysics of justice. What a fantastic philosophical treatise written by Imam Ali. The metaphysics of justice. So what is justice? How do I define justice? And then you find that it's, it does not compare to any other of the just, uh, judicial theories uh, that, were, that are presented in the contemporary literature. Then you have Ali and self-persistence and personal identity. Then you also have the idea of Ali in moral psychology, and I'll be covering a bit of that today after uh, philosophy of mind. Great, great significance and contribution of Imam Ali to philosophy of mind. You have the total destruction of physicalism. Very interesting, and I'll, I'll be covering that in more detail after. Uh, and also you have the relevance of Ali and quantum mechanics, uh, which I think my great experts, Yasser, will in, probably in future conferences come up and uh, present on the relevance of Ali. There are so many, I've just covered a very few examples. It just goes on and on and on. There's a great vast literature and is relevant to almost every single contemporary scholarship out there. Without any further to do, uh, concluding remarks before I ask uh, Mohammed to come up. So there's a lot of historical documentations possessed, if I can summarize everything, in contemporary scholarship concerning Ali, uh, and it's severely demar demarcated by historical political biases of ruling political bodies such as Omeyyads, Abbasid, the Safavid period during Shiite times. Uh, you have the interpreta interpretation of sources, I'm tongue tied today. Interpretation of sources are at the heart of the difference in the rift between the Sunni and the Shiite sources. So, as I mentioned earlier in the example, uh, you can have many interpretations of, uh, 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 of Adil Akon, for example. Obviously, you're going to have one interpretation that will say that no. Uh, Ali was given spiritual leadership, not political, and you have others as you know, it's political and spiritual. So what really comes back down to the Sunni and Shiite schism is merely polemics. It's merely semantics. Uh, there's not much greater difference than, uh, than that. If we can truly understand the, the essence of the Sunni Shiite divide, we realize that Ali is neither Sunni nor Shiite. He does not belong to any. Ali belongs to humanity. Okay. Western scholarship as well has only focused on Ali's political career and mystical attributions. So for Henry Corbin, Henry Lamens, uh, Keitani, the, all, the earliest Orientalists that have kind of covered an understanding of Ali from a very one-dimensional perspective. Okay, so there needs to be, the final concluding remark is that there needs to be a serious study on the contributions of Ali to contemporary uh, literature contemporary academic circles. Um, I'd, love, I'd now like to ask uh, Mohammed to come up and present. He will be giving a, a, a presentation on 
I guess, the socio-political theories uh, and humanitarianism of the Iran, of Ali and Ali Talib. Uh, and bear in mind that this is very important. Um, as I'm aware, uh, Mohammed does cover interesting philosophy as well, socio-political, like Spinoza, uh, very interesting. Um, is laughing as he changed his topic now. <laughs> I'm hoping that, that hopefully you'll all enjoy this presentation. So then,